Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and we're very, very excited on this uh, particular episode to be talking to someone who's going to be in somewhat our area in just a couple of days. He's at the Gothic Theater uh, doing his comedy, which he has been doing for a couple of decades now, and actually our radio station is sponsoring this particular gig at the Gothic Theater of the one and only Gallagher. Yes, you can see him in a couple of days, but we have him on the phone right here, calling from California. Gallagher, first of all, thank you so much for calling in, and uh, and how are you? Just fine. I'm 65 years old, and I've been doing comedy since I was 25, four decades. Wow. And more people are going to hear this radio interview than are coming to my show. So I really feel <laughs> like I'm doing my job more when I do the interview than when I do my show. Well, that, that is most kind of you, and I, I doubt that. I think the Gothic Theater will pack them in, especially since all these UNC students are going to be listening to this interview and then buying tickets to come to see you. There you go. That's how it works. So, But I'm going to yeah. talk to all the students that are going to listen and not buy tickets. <laughs> Well, well, yeah. If you tell all your jokes now, why should they? You know, you'll, you'll have to save a couple of the punchlines for for later on. But did I hear you correctly? Just before we we got on the air, that um, every videotape that you ever did, every special, I guess, for Showtime and whatever, you were you weren't um, straight. You were kind of high. I was because I said to myself, I never rehearsed straight. So why would I make my video straight? Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure I was as funny and as spontaneous and ready to ad lib as I am uh, as I am when I'm smoking marijuana. Oh my gosh! Well, I mean, you are kind of among friends, at least in in Colorado, because this is one of the <laughs> just like California, it's a boundary pushing state as far as dope. But do you, have you ever tried going on stage in the past thirty, forty years? Cold, sober, straight, no dope? Oh, yeah, because I can't carry it with me on the airplane. A lot of times I end up at the theater and I never scored. So, no, I do about half of my shows uh, straight. So, But you're more comfortable under a bit of the influence. Well, you know what? You get a longer show because I can't keep track of time. <laughs> I'll do two and a half to three hours. Oh, my gosh. That's quite a... And, and, and again, I asked a question uh, right at first about your health because you had a minor heart attack just a couple of months ago, didn't you? Yes, I had a major heart attack in 2000. Oh. And yeah. then uh, another artery clocked up while I was on stage in Rochester, Minnesota, and I was 5.3 miles from the Mayo Clinic, and I think I got a Yes, in my heart within 20 minutes. Nice. Now, I, I hate to say this, but, you know, that is on YouTube, that moment of you getting a heart attack, um, you know, a, a yeah. few weeks back. It's it's kind of wild to see, but thank God you're okay. But when, when you tell the doctors and you go to these places, hey, I still want to, you know, smoke dope, do they discourage it after two heart attacks? Or is it good for you? Uh. Yeah, they discourage all of that. But you can either have a long, boring life or a short, fun one. Well, you're already in the middle. 65 is not so short anymore, so you've already passed the odds. Do you? Are you healthy? That's what I say. <laughs> That's what I say. I've already done 65 of most of the years you get. Plus, I changed the world. People now get splashed at every amusement park in America. There's Blue Man Group, Quar, Insane Clown Posse, even Shamu splashes the audience. <laughs> but you were first. You you got there before. I was. I was the pathfinder. I boldly went where none had gone before. As well, and, and I think you even like Letterman. You vote, you had a little grudge against him for so you know stealing, as it were, the idea of smashing and throwing things. Or is that just a, you know, were you just kind of kidding about that? That so did he or? Did he or did he not throw watermelons off of a building in New York? Oh, he certainly did. He absolutely did, of course. Well, and he started at the same little club in the valley that I was at. There was just me and him and a couple of singers And when we first started. And so he knows me very intimately. And 
so you feel like that was just some idea that he brought, and he remembered you doing it, and said, hey, why don't we transmute it instead of smashing it, we'll just throw it off a building, and then, then as you did, you don't just do watermelons, you do all these other foods and beverages and, and objects, so... I, I can. Do you feel that? You, sorry, I never was real mad about it. I want to change the world, uh, but I, he didn't fool me. I mean, I know it's my joke, but you, I wanted to show people that television needs to have funny pictures. Huh? That, I, I did want to get into that. Do you feel sometimes that you don't get the credit that you deserve for how much comedy you've done, your longevity, and also the fact that maybe prop comics don't get the props? that other comics do, you know? Well, I do a two-and-a-half to three-hour show, and you and you just can't use props the whole time. Of I talk most of the time. So I'm really a monologist, just like Jay Leno and, mm -hmm. and any other talking comic, but I add props because it's the right thing to do as an entertainer to make an interesting picture. Otherwise, you look like a newsman. Hmm. Good. Good point. Did, was that initially like when you first first started? Uh, you were actually you were supporting another entertainer thirty forty years ago. You were kind of helping him out, and you decided uh, to to kind of try your hand at comedy too. Did you immediately gravitate to objects as well as as verbal, or was that later on? Uh, I wanted to make sure that my jokes weren't stolen, and so I thought if I write a joke about an object I'm holding, then can't really do that joke unless you have the object too. Good point. Good point. And so, and did it immediately work for you? Like in the first few weeks of getting on stage, were you incredibly nervous? Were you comfortable because you were stoned? How did it feel when you were first starting out doing what you were doing? Well, you know what? I wasn't stoned at the very beginning okay. because I was nervous. But if you smash food, you always win. <laughs> they always say, what a great show. And so that's uh, kind of a, 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 a good thing and a bad thing is that I was famous almost immediately. My third sh show was on national television. Wow. I've done two, two other shows for money before I got on to the Mike Douglas show in Philadelphia. Wow. And, and on Mike Douglas, you already were starting to, to do that. Let me, let me ask a, a question. It just occurred to me. Um, you know, with, with our litigious society and people suing McDonald's because hot coffee spilled, did you ever run into trouble because someone in the audience got hit with a flying, uh, you know, bit of fruit? Or, or does everybody sign a waiver before they walk into your concert? Uh, no, they don't sign a waiver, and I have been sued maybe oh. three or four times, uh, which isn't a lot over 30 years. And your defense is what? If they come to see a Gallagher show, they ought to expect dot, dot, dot? Well, I, no, I don't think the people who sued me were injured. Oh, oh, I see. Which, oh, yeah, they just wanted to, oh, yeah. I think they made it up. Wow. Now, um, let me ask about longevity, though. Since you are 65 and here you are driving, like, all these hours to a concert and then going to Colorado and maintaining a heavy tour schedule to spike a couple of health incidents and the fact that you are, you know, I assume an AARP member. Have you, have, do you have to pace yourself now? Do you foresee a time in the next five to ten years when you'll have to take it easier, just do the weekends, that sort of thing? Well, I'm sitting down right now, and you <laughs> sit down on a plane, and you uh, sit a lot in your dressing room, and you sit at the hotel. I think these people that complain about travel are sissy. Whoa. Don't think much. I don't see what the big problem is. I can sit at home on a couch or sit in a car that's moving, and my heart doesn't know the difference. That's a, that's a good point, but you're also doing two and a half you know, to three hour shows at your age. Has that got, is, is, do you feel exactly the same that you did 30 years ago, or around the two and a half hour mark do you start huffing and puffing a little? Well, are you there? I'm here. That's why I think I had a heart attack, was I didn't know that I was having one. It didn't really feel like I, was, uh, I wasn't huffing and puffing. It just felt like I needed to um, fart. Oh, okay. 
But it was more than the, than that, obviously. Um, yeah, but every time up until that time in my life, it had always been I had to fart. But this time I was dying, and that I uh, I just blame God for. Uh, it's just too close. Our stomach is right next to our heart, and you just really can't tell which one hurt. Well, you, something didn't go up your left arm. I mean, you didn't feel that usual. Uh, no, uh, no. And then they say it's like somebody sitting on your chest, but I've had that. And it wasn't the same. <laughs> By the way, we're talking to Gallagher here on Dave's Gone By. Everybody, go see him at the Gothic Theater just two days from now and asking Gallagher all sorts of things about his life and career. Do you have a, are you married? Do you have a family? Well, I married two women that I ended up divorcing, and I had a child with each one of them, and uh, they're pretty much grown. My son is 22 and my daughter is 30. Oh, wow. So I really don't feel like I need to hang around with them. They're doing their life. And I really wasn't a good dad as far as being at home because I did travel. But I just thought to myself, I could either not do it at all or do it halfway, and I still have people in the world. And so I did it halfway, and I've got these two uh, wonderful people. My son is very creative. Oh, yeah. Um, and my daughter is a Cracker Jack businesswoman. Okay. And so you're still in touch. I mean, it's not like you're estranged, but you don't have to be there all the time for them. They're, they're grown, and, and you're making your living. You're traveling. Yeah, but I just, I just left my son uh, to drive up uh, here. We're trading stocks, and we were very concerned about the drop in the market. Oh, yeah. And I just saw my daughter over the weekend. She attended a wedding in Los Angeles because she lives in Phoenix and I saw her and she's going to have a baby in four weeks and she already has a year and a half old baby. Oh, can, can, uh, my people would say Mazel Tov. That's oh, I, I hope it uh, is healthy and all that. That's great. So good. Are you, are you dating? Are you seeing anybody? No, because, you know, your plumbing doesn't work after you have a heart attack. For a while, I assume at some point, I mean, once you have a stent, you can't... Uh, it's a totally different tube, dude. Uh, you would think that, but um, I'm no... Uh, who is that guy with Playboy? Uh, um, well, you know, his, his uh, doesn't work, and mine don't either. Oh, oh. Do you th is that going to change as you recuperate? Or is that a permanent... No, I don't think I'm going to... Take any, I'll, I'll smoke dope with a heart attack, but I'm not going to take them pills. Oh no 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 no! Certainly not the blue, the little blue wonder pills. No, that that's that's a third heart attack waiting to happen right there. Well, I'm I'm kind of sorry to hear that. That but, probably won't be videotaped either. <laughs> but but then do you have a coterie of friends and acquaintances that you can hang with in all the different cities and, and comedians that you're in touch with, so that you're not sort of alone, lonely on the road. Now, my show starts at 7 o'clock. Uh -huh. People start to walk into the lobby. I start answering their questions and taking pictures and signing autographs and meeting with them. So if you meet 500 fans mm. every night you do a show, you really don't feel like you need close friends. I've got millions of fans all across America. Well, that, that is certainly true, of course, and I never thought... And it's, maybe you're one of those people who's just more comfortable being loved by the crowd than by individual people that you would normally be intimate with. And I don't just mean physically, the tube work and kind of yeah. intimate, you know. Yeah, the great thing about travel is I'm meeting people I'm going to leave. <laughs> I kind of know that feeling, believe it or not. Now, Now, one of the questions that... Um, your PR person, who was very kind to set this all up, uh, said that I, I recommended that I should ask, so I'm very happy to ask it, is that you own a few patents on things that you have invented? Yes, and I'm very excited about my slot machines that are going to be coming out and revolutionize the floor of the casino and have more fun when people lose their money. I've added my comedy ideas to the very boring slot machine business, and they're working on the software right now as we speak. 
I guess, I guess that makes, I mean, uh, in my head I'm already picturing objects being smashed when you, I mean, that, that sort of seems to be the most obvious thing, but uh, can you talk a little bit about what it is, or is it too early in the process and your fake people will steal? Oh, I can tell you. I've got a patent, so people really can't uh, oh, cool. steal them. Yeah. The watermelons, the watermelons fall down to the pay line, and when they hit it, they can either bounce, crack in half, or break into a lot of pieces. You're a winner if the resulting action matches, not just the icon or picture. Oh, that's funny. That's really... Yeah, because you could have girls in bikinis uh, with umbrellas falling from the sky, and their bras could fall off, or they could do the split. Or hmm. you could have snowflakes coming down and little elves that have to catch them without breaking. The, the ideas are infinite, and it will add more interest and fun to the game. Right, because you see people at Las Vegas or Atlantic City, and basically, I mean, they're there and they're churning. Nobody's smiling, you know, unless they get a payoff. Everybody's kind of grim and just pumping money in, and hopefully, I mean, and with you, maybe, you know, people will see, oh, well, that's kind of cute, you know, which you don't yeah, really I've get. Got a, I've got one they're making right now that's a beauty parlor. Mm -hmm. The women um, uh, have their head in a dryer, and then when you pull the dryers off, their hair is all screwed up. Yeah. The ones that, and if their hair matches, then they're a winner. Oh, that's cute. I mean, really cool stuff. I bet you wish you thought of this like 20 years ago, you know? I mean, th is this well, this? Yeah. Uh, I did think of it in 2006. It's taken this long to get the very complacent uh, gaming industry to pay attention. Mm. Very um, uh, close to creativity. And have you invented other things over the years that you also have patents on? Yes, I have a toilet that doesn't overflow when you put the toilet paper in and try to make a mess at the ball game or the theater bathroom. Okay, well, I have, what's the secret on that? How do you, is it just a wider hole or what? No, no, I have within the toilet a float. And the float goes up when the water in the bowl goes up, but the kids can't get to that float to block it. And so when the water comes up, it turns the water supply off. Huh. Oh, wow. Okay. I and mean, you thought of this... I, I'm, I'm just curious, What? when did the light bulb go off? Was it one too many times that one of your children clogged the toilet and you said, I've got to think of something, or what? No, it happened at, a, at one of the theaters. I just noticed that there's no toilet, uh, there's no paper towels in a bathroom anymore because they don't want to give the kids anything right. to stick in the toilet. And, um, and so I knew the reason, and so I thought of an answer. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's, I mean, you were going to mention one of the other things that you invented? Yes, I invented a jack that uh, doesn't fall down so that the, mechanic doesn't get his head crushed when he's working on the car. Oh, wow. Well, that's... I'm sure you were in the gratitude of a lot of mechanics from that one. Good for you. You would think you would think that mechanics would figure this one out, <laughs> but every year, you can look at the numbers, hundreds of mechanics have their head cracked a little bit when somebody touches the handle of the jack, and it sticks way out. Right, right, but yeah. And, and it goes down a little bit. Well, I put a button on the handle of the jack that lifts the little piece of metal that stops the jack from going down. So cool. And, and how do you publicize this? In other words, you don't just apply with a patent office. How do you, when you have an idea like this that can change um, some people's lives, what do you do? Call your agent, your manager, and say, okay, I've got this, I'm getting a patent, tell the world? Or how does it work? You actually do go to the patent attorney and you search and see if anybody else has invented it. Then you apply for the patent and then you go around with it. Like I've got the patent on solar powered vending machines, which Whoa. I took to Coca Cola. And are they using it? Did they I think that I think they're irritated that a comedian invented it and not them. Uh, well, you know, Coke rules the world, of course. Or, well, pot rules your, rules your world, but coke rules the rest of the world. No, but, um, well, that, that's, I mean, that's really cool stuff. And, and that solar-powered vending machine does bring us to this whole Uncle Earth thing and this, this um, conservationist 
kick that you're into right now. What is what is this Uncle Earth stuff? Well, you know, before I was a comedian, I was a chemist. Oh, wow. Then I decided I wanted to be a writer, and I actually was the editor of a conservation newspaper in West Virginia, and we uh, were against strip mining and ruining the landscape to get us the coal. Uh-huh. And so I've been really involved in the green movement for almost my whole life. And so I do what I can as a comedian. One time I was the river. I did a poem where uh, on one of my shows where I spoke out as if I was the river, and I wore a piece of fabric that was blue, and then they just put water on the blue part, you know, blue screen. Uh-huh. And then I did a whale poem on one of my shows to conserve the whale uh, population. And uh, then this Uncle Herb thing is where I made my head to look like the planet Earth, and then I told jokes as the Earth. I said, what would the Earth say if it could talk to the people who were on it? And then I put that on the Internet, not YouTube. Yeah, that, that's still on YouTube, and it's very, very funny. I was going to play the uh, the audio from that on the show, but it's better if you go to YouTube because it really is cool with the costumes and, and the projections on it for, for all the l- listeners who want to see Gallagher and whether or not you're going to the Gothic Theater to see him. Do you, do you have another minute or two with us, Gallagher, by any chance? Yes, I do. I've got eight hours. <laughs> I, well, I, I only have three hours, so so you uh, you trump me there. But you know, with with the conservationist stuff, and also of course with your feelings about certain rules and regulations and dope and all that, you you come across on one way as a liberal, and yet if you read some of the postings on the internet and stuff, you you kind of people are terming you as very kind of reactionary conservative. Where do you stand socially, politically? Well, why don't you ask Obama? Because he got elected as a Democrat and continued Bush's program. I think everybody exhibits both sides. Um, and, and those people that have an opinion about me on the Internet are just having an opinion. True. I'm telling jokes. I'm just a joke teller. I'm not running for political office. And jokes have an attitude. It doesn't necessarily mean it's my attitude. I'm an actor on a stage. Right on. Right. I mean, I don't think people should think that uh, you're seeing the real person uh, when they're on stage. I certainly don't tell jokes all day long, so that that's a bit different. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to entertain. Uh, jokes have to be a surprise. I have to be outrageous and push the limits of our society, and those limits get more and more liberal. You couldn't say "ass" until President Bush said it. Wow! And so, and then uh, oral sex was quite a no-no until President Clinton committed it. And <laughs> so things change all the time, and people get bored by what was outrageous just a few years earlier. But it also kind of goes in cycles and, and swings back and forth. And, you know, one year a nipple slip on the Super Bowl is this giant cause celeb, and then they'll do an oral sex joke on two and a half men. And you wonder, what, what's the thinking, you know? Um, but do I don't you, know. Uh, I think that America is more confused than I am about who they are. Mm-hmm. Just for those reasons you just mentioned, um, they do both things at once. And it's because America is, com- is a liberal people on both coasts, on the East Coast and the West Coast, and then conservative folks in the middle. Right. And uh, I know this because I tell them jokes. And you just can't have the same show for um, Texas that you have in Los Angeles. Is that really... Really true. I mean, if if you go to te- you just can't, you have to massage it a different way. You've got to take out the heavy liberal stuff or the the really vulgar, dirty stuff. Texas and Idaho and hell, Colorado just won't go for it. Well, it all depends on what city in Texas mm. are liberal cities, also. And but they're rowdy. The, no, by no means do I take away the dirty jokes in Texas because they're really rowdy. And they just don't care. They'll laugh if it's a good joke. But if I get to Atlanta or Seattle or Minneapolis or Los Angeles, they'll judge the political um, uh, position of the joke and, and, and decide not to laugh because they don't agree with the politics of it. And that's, you know, so silly. <laughs> 
That's interesting. That, so, in, in a way, you're hitting back a little bit at this whole um, right, self-righteous liberal mindset, the NPR kind of mindset, which, you know, even, even though I'm certainly more of a Democrat and a liberal myself, that kind of gets my hackles up at the idea that, well, liberals are, are you know, perfect and Republicans are Satan. And sometimes they are, but it's, it's certainly not so clear-cut by any, any stretch of the imagination. I, I irritate plenty of conservative people, when, or religious people. I talk about God, and I'll talk about anything. Um, freedom of speech. Right. Do you, do you feel that, there's, that political correctness is the death of comedy? Do you feel anything could and should go in the context of it's funny, it's, you know, just humor or satire? Do you have a moment to just sort of finish and put a capper on everything? Yeah. Great, great. Thanks so much. And this is, I, I, I've had a great time. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the interview so far. Uh, but just like one more quick question or two, and then we can do a proper wrap-up. So, um, you ready? Yeah. Great. Three, two, one. And um, also, Gallagher, I'm, I'm kind of curious of uh, political correctness you might think, is the death of comedy, or do you need there to be some people going, no, no, don't do that, don't say that, because you need something to push against? Well, I don't think I'm the only comedian who is guilty of saying things that might offend somebody. In fact, the comedy is a towel that snaps the rear end of somebody, that's what makes it really funny. I don't know how I would talk about something. Even Bill Cosby talked about Fat Albert. And that really wasn't the best thing to do about fat people. Right. But, you know, you've got to make fun of something. And I chose stupidity. <laughs> I just make fun of people being stupid or inconsistent. Well, that's... that's... And, and let me ask about the gathering of material. Are you someone who kind of constantly evolves and shapes the act every single time, or do you kind of get everything together, and then every six months to a year, you'll change everything and come out with a new, different show? Uh, I come up with a different show every night. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do two and a half to three hours. I'm going to talk about what just happened in the news, and... Um, and I might see an observation that I had seen my entire life. Like when you retire, they give you a watch. And I've known that my whole life, but it never occurred to me how stupid it is to give a watch to somebody who never needs to meet you on appointment again. <laughs> Good point. And I, I guess that will be going into the show on Monday. Well, you know, that, that's, that's... Well, I've been saying that for about two months now, and it works really good. Uh, here's a good joke. Okay. Chinese people all look alike. Why do they have a Facebook? <laughs> uh, have you gotten any flack about that, or, or do people just laugh? Well, I'm going to go up here to the San Francisco area, and there's going to be plenty of Chinese people. But I think it's just a joke. Of course. Uh, you know, comedians need prejudice. Otherwise, we can't have these stereotypes. Every black comedian I know talks about black and white stereotypes and nothing else. Hmm. Do you ever call them Nobody on that? Nobody says yeah. anything about them. And I think that gay comedians talk about straight people all of the time. And nobody says anything about them criticizing straight people. But if a straight person says one gay joke, or if I were to tell a black joke, or a fat joke, or uh, like I did, a Chinese joke, um, then what's the big problem here? I, it's not fair, is it? Um, well, you're, you're preaching to the converted, of course, you know, and, and to, to me and I'm sure my listeners. But, you know, people will say, well, it has to be the right context, and it has to be this, and it has to be that. Well, here's what the context is. A bar late at night, everybody's drunk. Now, what are you going to say in that situation? Are you going to be politically correct like there's somebody running for Congress? No, you're going to be... Have, because they have telephones and they make a video, 
or or they make a video after the show and tell what I said during the show, that's out of context. I'm a nightclub comic. Right. If freedom of speech doesn't exist in a nightclub, where does it exist? Because you can't say anything you want to on television. There's sponsors and there's networks that are all afraid of getting telephone emails and complaints. And right. So really, freedom of speech only exists on the nightclub stage, and now they want to fart around with that. Well, I, I agree. But, I mean, look what happened to Michael Richards, and then they banned the N-word from that club. Which I think is, is well, I nuts. I never say that anyway. Right. But Michael Richards is not a comedian. He is a comic actor. Mm-hmm. And when you when you get on stage and you're not an experienced professional and you're not doing good, you reach for the lowest common type of comedy, and that's what he did because he doesn't have three hours of material like I do. Right. But would he? Okay, he doesn't have the experience, but he was giving nightclub comedy a little bit of a shot. But do you think he should have been pilloried for just grasping at straws, and it turned out not to be funny? And people that laughed, it won't be an incident at all. Well, I happen to know that club that he was at, and it is predominantly a black audience. And he could have seen that and known that it wouldn't have been appreciated by the audience. Right. Or, or if he had phrased it differently or made his point better, the audience would have loved it and applauded. He just, he reached for the joke, he missed it, and because the joke was an offensive one, that's why everybody, you know, went berserk. Or, or at least that's my thinking about it. Well, you can't please everyone. Uh, who are your influences, by the way, as, as comedians? Was Cosby one of your idols um, growing up in the ranks? Oh, I think he's boring. He's sit down during his show. You can't sit down on stage. And he smokes a cigar on stage, and he was the coach. Yeah, okay. I think that you've got to stand up. I don't think anybody should have a bottle of water on a stool. How sippy is that? <laughs> you know, George Burns did a, a show at 90 years old smoking a cigar, and he never took a drink of water. They're so stupid. Comedy is hypnotism. When you stop and take a drink, you've lost eye contact with the audience, and you're being presumptuous and cocky, saying, I'm so funny, I can take a break. And it's wrong. It's theater, and you should never take a drink during a show. Well, I assume it's also, you know, if you start to cough a little, or if your your throat gets a little sore, you don't, especially you're out there two and a half hours, you don't ever need, like, a little bit of tea? Nobody ever did until now. Okay. Nobody. Okay. Wow. Okay. The problem is that the water bottle is now turned into a teapot and some cups and saucers, <laughs> and next it'll be a table, and then they're going to sit down and have a snack. Where does it stop? It's wrong. If something is in the picture, it should have relevance to the picture or the act, and having a stool with water bottles on it is not relevant to comedy. Wow. Okay. So if, if not Cosby, then who? George who? Carlin and Rip ah. Taylor. Rip Taylor? Interesting, because he was so wild and out there with the confetti and the, you know, just being... Right. Yeah, okay. Me, he showed me that you can throw things on the audience. Interesting. I mean, Carlin, I get oh, because... I yeah. smashed an apple, which is just a little bit different than pieces of paper. You, and, and, well, good for you for crediting him. So, you know, you know, Letterman may not credit you, but at least you credit Rip Taylor with, with uh, certain, you know, aspects of what you do. Um, well, it's obvious to anybody who knows comedy that that's what I did, that I saw Rip on Merv, and he threw the confetti, and it was really funny, and so I broke the fourth wall also, and I violated it and touched the patron. That's why I don't have an agent or a manager, because they would have allowed it. They would say, can't you work around that, and we can't have insurance if you're going to be doing that. Huh. Okay, well, well, good for you, again, for, for bucking the trend and doing it your way. But how do you avoid what the trap that maybe Carlin fell into in those later years, when he just kind of became more bitter and cranky and angry on stage than funny? Um, Maybe it's just the nature of his 
way, or when he got off all the, the substances he was on, he realized he was a pretty unhappy guy. How do you avoid that? I'm not unhappy. I'm smiling at my life every day when I think of how I changed America and changed comedy and the outrageous things I did are really funny when you think about it. And look at my videos. They are really funny and different. And uh, that's all I wanted to do was to be a unique... You know, America should be the land of individuals, not people who blindly follow trends, fad, and fashion. I do not wear jeans that have already been pleached. I do not have tattoos. I am not distending my earlobe. I'm not being nutty. Good for you, man. That's, that's what crazy is. <laughs> Yeah, but you have certainly, um, not only on your videos, but right here on our, our radio waves today, you've, you've really put smiles on faces, I think, and, uh, and really been yourself, which is exactly what we've wanted and what we expect from someone like Gallagher. Please, everybody, go see him at the Gothic Theater while he's in town. Really, a living, living comedy legend, 65 and still going strong, despite some odds. Gallagher, do you have any last thoughts um, for, for all of us. Well, you know what? My act is not a secret. There are people who leave emails on my website all of the time, and you can call the theaters that I've been to and ask them how the show went. Some people say being at my show was the best time they ever had. How can you retire from that or stop sharing that with people? Well, you, you don't get a better recommendation than that. Ladies and gentlemen, Gallagher, I want to thank you very, very much for sharing with us and being in the neighborhood. It's really been a pleasure. Bye-bye.